Matthew chapter 24. This is study three, yep. Matthew 24. Again, what we'll do, like we did last time, just to get us in the context, Matthew 24 in relation to Revelation chapter 7. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 7, a tribulation passage. And this is where we're finding that Matthew 24 is situated. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Got a cross-reference there, you may want to write down. Revelation 14, verse 3 and 4. And I've got men, so have a look at that, see what it says. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand, of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. <coughs> when you read things like this, you think, oh, it's not that interesting or it's not that exciting. But again, you know, read it, get into it, and try and remember the tribes. So as we read this and reread it, try and remember the tribes. Judah, Reuben, Gad. Yep, try and remember that for next time. Get something out of it. The tribe of Asa were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Nep- Nep- sorry, Nephilim were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Manassas were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000 Anybody remember the twelve tribes? (laughs) Not yet. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and four beasts and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God saying Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be unto our God for ever and ever Amen it's a great verse isn't it blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power, and might, be unto our God for ever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Pause in there just for a second. <clears throat> Yesterday, a guy sends me a booklet and asks me to, um, you probably saw the, the, the email, just to see what I thought of it. You know, everybody wants to add things to our collection or whatever it is, you know. They, Will you use our tracks? Will you print our tracks? All this kind of stuff. And um, that's fine, don't worry. And um, he said yesterday about, he used this, you know, saying about the Christian um, having their robes made white, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And he quoted from this verse, 7.14. But there was a difference. Your robes aren't washed in the blood of the Lamb. You are washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
There are no works to your salvation. There are works to the salvation in the tribulation. Faith and works. You don't have to wash your robes. Ye are washed in the blood of Lamb. There's a big difference there. And um, so we sent him an uh, answer to that question saying, you know, if you're going to print your tract, just get this doctrine right because that, that is an error. Therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into, unto living wa- fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. <coughs> now to Matthew 24. <coughs> Matthew 24. We're in the tribulation here. Well, the context is, as we're studying this, Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall, shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to, unto the end, the same shall be saved." And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, we're picking up, again we could read the chapter again, but we're picking up <coughs> excuse me, from verse 12, and I want to read down to verse 20. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now this is a passage that is often misapplied, misinterpreted and misunderstood. But he that shall endure unto the end, the end, the same shall be saved. Now the Christian who does not read, study or understand the scriptures will lift this verse from its context and teach that a Christian can lose his salvation if he does not hold out till the end. We've heard that before, haven't we, Um, from different denominations, quoting that verse. He that endures to the end shall be saved. But this, this of course, is what we English call (laughs) Tommy Rot. My granddad used to say that. That's Tommy Rot. A millennial and post-millennial Christians, and hopefully we're getting to understand how anti-scriptural these Christians are, who believed in apprehending the promises to Israel for the church 
would teach such nonsense. This is where it probably originated from, i.e. Roman Catholicism. Verse 13 and 14, But he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The gospel of the kingdom. That's not the gospel that we preach today. We understand that. We preach the gospel that Paul revealed to the apostles and 1 Corinthians 15 uh, the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ verses 1 to 4 and the blood atonement obviously the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ it's only the blood of Christ that can wash away our sins and we trust, somebody said once you know, how do you become a Christian, you become a Christian the moment that you quit trusting your own righteousness to get you to heaven and start trusting the righteousness of Jesus Christ, so we have put on the new man. We've put on Christ and we are born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit and the Trinity lives within us. There's a lot of things happen. We get imputed righteousness and justification the moment we trust Jesus Christ for our sins forgiven. A lot happens when you get saved. So we don't preach. We don't go around preaching the kingdom's coming. We don't preach the gospel of the kingdom. And there's certain things that are associated with the gospel of the kingdom. But let's just have a look at it in regard to the differences here. So we've said about he that endures he that endure to the unto the end, the same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom. Note, no one's life is being discussed in verse fourteen. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. It is the end of a period of time, not an individual's life. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So it's a period of time, not an individual's life. There are no Christians present here in verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him, privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and, the, and of the end of the world? There, no, there are no Christians present in this passage here. And the land that is being discussed is Palestine. Verse 16 says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. The audience addressed are Jews. Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not that all these things, see ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. So the audience addressed here are Jews. They are observing the Old Testament law. Verse 15 to 20. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house Neither let him that is in the field return to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter neither on the Sabbath day. They are observing the Old Testament law. They are worshipping in a temple. Verse 15, when shall therefore see the abomination spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso read let him understand. And then you'd have to read the passage 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They're worshipping in a temple. There's no house church there. It's a temple. No churches. They are not spiritual Jews. They are literal, physical Jews. And no one but a Bible pervert would distort the context to get the meaning. Got a cross-reference there. Romans 2. Romans 2, verse 29. So people try and bend and twist because they can't understand. So they'd say, oh, they're spiritual Jews. You know, Israel's done away with them, the church is here, replacement theology, all that kind of stuff they go on about. 
Romans 2.29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. That's a spiritual Jew there. One inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. These are not spiritual Jews, these are literal Jews. The Christian already has a promise that he will endure to the end if that was under discussion. But it's not. This is a different gospel. We already know that we're going to endure to the end. We are saved already. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 7 and 8. So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end. He's going to confirm us unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're being confirmed unto the end. We don't have to endure to the end. Philippians 1 verse 6. Philippians 1 verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. You don't have to endure to the end. We will And the last one here, the second coming follows the end in this passage and not the death of the believer. Look at verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. In verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. (coughs) So the second coming follows the end in the passage in regard to the tribulation. It is therefore apparent that Matthew 24, 13 but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved has nothing to do directly or indirectly with the salvation of anyone in the age of grace which we are living in. And it was never intended to be used by anyone under any condition, for any purpose, in that manner. It is not the gospel that we preach today. Like Hebrews 3, verse 6 and 14, let's turn there. Hebrews 3, verse 6 and 14. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end, verse 14, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. See, the end keeps coming up. So like Hebrews 3, verse 6 and 14, a period of time is being discussed and this period of time is defined in the immediate context. The context defines how the verse is applied. And it is not applied to anyone in this dispensation. We understand that? I think that makes good sense, that does. The very next verse in Matthew 24, verse 14, defines the end. So, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Verse 14 locates the end as that period of time wherein the gospel of the kingdom not the gospel we preach today, is preached. Since this gospel is not the gospel of the grace of God, like we said, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4, 1 to 6, given to the Christian, you need to read Galatians 1, verse 11 to 13, but we'll read it. Again, we said we're going to walk through it. Why rush? It's all good stuff. Galatians 1, 11 to 13. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after uh, after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. 
So the gospel, the grace of God, given to Paul, given to the Christian, by the apostle to the Gentiles, which obviously is Paul. Romans 2, 16. Romans 2, 16. In that day when God shall judge the secrets of men, is that by Jesus Christ, according, yeah, according to my gospel. It was revealed to Paul. You've just read that in the book of Galatians 11 to 13. So since this gospel is not the gospel of the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 15, given to the Christian, Galatians 1, by the apostle to the Gentiles, Romans 2.16, it most certainly would have no bearing on the life of any Christian from Pentecost to the rapture. Capiche? <laughs> he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, has no bearing on the Christian today. It's a plainly a reference to a law-abiding Jew in Palestine. That is who it is directed to. That is called rightly dividing the word of truth. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, is plainly a reference to a law-abiding Jew in Palestine, immediately preceding the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And no amount of distortion could ever make it apply to anything else unless you are a Bible corrector and a perverter of the truth. People like Stephen Anderson and sadly now Kent Hovind has followed his shallow teaching. And this gospel of the kingdom, gospel of the kingdom, there are four forms of the gospel in scripture. The gospel of the kingdom is our first one. Turn to 2 Samuel the gospel of the kingdom. 2 Samuel 7. Verse 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne, throne, shall be established forever. There is a gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom of heaven is the literal physical, Davidic kingdom that is going to rest upon this earth one day. It's coming. Daniel 2 is the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4. Matthew 4. So you want to read Daniel 2. But we won't read all of that because of time. But Matthew 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Galilee, Israel, synagogues, Jews, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. You'll notice, and we'll probably get into this in a little bit, but the signs and wonders and the healings are associated with the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you can get that, that will clear a lot of problems up in your life in regard to healing. It's associated with the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. The gospel of the kingdom, sickness and disease, healing is associated with the gospel of the kingdom. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. And then you have the second gospel in scripture which is different to the gospel of the kingdom and it's called the the gospel of the grace of God. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, has nothing to do with the gospel of the kingdom, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, death of Christ and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures death, burial, resurrection that's the gospel 
of the grace of God that Paul, that was revealed to Paul, that he went around preaching and he revealed it to the apostles. Now it's very interesting, I was looking at the other day, saying about the so-called two ordinances, the breaking of bread and baptism. We're not hyper-dispensational, we break bread, some people call it communion, and we also baptise. That is a picture of the gospel. The breaking of bread, do this till he come. We're celebrating what? The death. Yes? The death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which was shed for you. We are, we are recognising, we are celebrating, we are thanking God for his death. That's what that ordinance, so-called, don't like that word, but that ordinance is all about, the death of Christ. We don't celebrate his birth in that sense, you know. We're not told to celebrate his birth. We may do, but we're not told to. But his death in the communion service and the breaking of bread service. Then you have the baptism. And the baptism really is associated with the burial and resurrection. Isn't that interesting? So in those two ordinances, you've got death, burial, resurrection. I thought that was good. Third gospel. So you've got the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the grace of God, and now you have the everlasting gospel, found in Revelation 14. Revelation 14. Verse 6. And note, no human being is preaching this gospel. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. This is in the tribulation. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So this gospel that is preached by an angel is called the everlasting gospel and, it, and the message is, he was saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. That's the gospel. That's called the everlasting gospel. You don't preach that today. That happens during the tribulation and is preached by an angel. And the fourth one, and really this is, ties in with the second, obviously, is Paul's Gospel. We've just read Romans 2.16. Romans 2.16. In that day when God shall judge the secrets of the men by Jesus Christ according to my Gospel, Paul calls it. In Ephesians 3, my Gospel. Again, it was revealed to Paul. He spent time with in the desert and in Arabia with the Lord Jesus Christ and things were revealed to him that weren't revealed to any of the other apostles you'll find that most of the mysteries were revealed to Paul which is also very interesting Ephesians 3 verse 1 to 7 for this cause I Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles he's the apostle to the Gentiles if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you would how that by revelation it was revealed to him, he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel, which I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. So that's Paul's gospel. So the, this gospel of the kingdom, in Matthew 24, 14, back to there, this gospel of the kingdom, Matthew defines it in a score of places. Um, let me just give you a few of these. Matthew 3, 2, the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 3, 2. And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is coming. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. He's the king of the kingdom. And when he was on earth, the kingdom of God was present and the kingdom of heaven was present. Very interesting study. 
The kingdom of heaven is only mentioned in the book of Matthew, which is predominantly dealing with the Jew. Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sicknesses, sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Matthew 8, verse 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 9.35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And 10 verse 7, we're just doing a few here. And as ye go, preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's not the gospel we preach today. So the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, in every case, in every case, in every case, is a literal, physical, visible, messianic, Davidic kingdom promised to the son of David who will reign on David's throne at Jerusalem Ezekiel 27 Ezekiel 27 verse 25 I've written that down wrong haven't I Yeah, I have not I? I think I need to give you that. I need to... I've written that down wrong, sorry. Ezekiel 27, 25, I think is wrong. That's when Jesus reigns on David, or sits on David's throne. I'll find that one out for you and come back to you. Somebody can mark that down for me, please. JWs cannot, Jehovah's Witnesses cannot differentiate the difference between the two kingdoms. Most can't be nice, but the cults especially... The JWs are always mixing up the wrong kingdoms. They're trying to bring in the kingdom of heaven on earth. But then again, neither can most Christians. We, you know, unless you get really into this and deep Bible study, you just, it's a smorgasbord of stuff. You just try and bend everything and f- to twist and fit, but it doesn't do that. Pentecostals, Reformed and Calvinistic, Baptist and Brethren, they all mix up the um, differences. They can't see the difference in the kingdom of heaven regarding the difference between that and the kingdom of God. So, back to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. For a witness unto all nations. Notice that the word nations, as in Matthew 28, turn there, Matthew 28, Verse 18 and 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The word nations is set over against the word kingdom. The kingdom is the Lord's and it is Jewish. Acts 3. The kingdom is the Lord's and it is Jewish. Acts 3, verse 19 to 26. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Blotted out when? when Jesus Christ comes at the second advent. And and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up, like unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. You want to look at Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 and 19 in regard to that. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, that prophet, 
shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. The kingdom of the Lord's, the kingdom is the Lord's and it is Jewish. And the message is to be preached to the Gentiles in the tribulation as a witness. Yeah? You've got, oh, thank you. Ezekiel 37, 25, yeah? Thank you. That verse was 37. Thank you very much. That needs to be changed in the newsletter as well, especially for the ministry years. If someone can remind me on that, please. So it's Ezekiel 37. Thank you, girls, for finding that. Let's turn there. Ezekiel 37. It throws you, doesn't it? One verse, and it throws you, and then you try and (laughs) keep up. 37.25. Let's have a look. Well done. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant... Jewish, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children, and their children's children, for ever, and my servant David shall be their prince for ever. Right, so um, Jesus reigns in the millennium, then he hands over the millennial reign to, uh, to David. Um, it's David's throne at Jerusalem, and he will reign there during the millennium, and then he hands over to David. Afterwards, for an everlasting, he, he will look after the land forever then, as the Lord is in the heavenly Jerusalem with his bride. Right, so get back to this now. So the kingdom is the Lord's, and it is Jewish, and this message to be preached is to be preached to the Gentiles in the tribulation as a witness. There is nothing in the passage remotely connected with missionaries spreading the gospel of all nations in this age. In this age. If you were preaching that gospel in this age, you would be cursed according to Galatians 1, 7-10 because the gospel of the kingdom is not the gospel that we preach today. We preach the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of the grace of God. That's Paul's gospel. Galatians 1, 7 to 10. And we start from 6, even I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That's not the gospel of the kingdom. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So we don't preach the gospel of the kingdom, otherwise you would be accursed. We preach the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Back to Mark, sorry, Matthew 24. Verse 13 and 14. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. You can see now how much of a tribulation passage this is. So as you can see from Matthew 24, 13 and 14 is the parting of the ways for the Bible believer and every other cult and religion. The Jehovah's Witness thinks that this refers to him and he must endure to the end to be saved. See, he's trying to bring in the wrong kingdom. He's trying to endure in an age that has not even begun yet. The amillennialist grabs it and pretends that the Jewish gospel of the kingdom is the plan of salvation in this age. See what a mess Christians get into when they wrongly divide the word of truth? There are many preachers, teachers, pastors, etc. who do not know what the end is, what the kingdom is, what the gospel of the kingdom is, who the nations are, nor to whom the message is addressed. And if you don't rightly divide that book, you're going to mess up your doctrine so bad. 
And as some preacher once said, if you don't get the Jew in the right place, in his right position, you'll try and apply scripture to yourself and it will never work. See how important it is to read in context, to rightly divide the scriptures? Well, that's our third study. We shall pick up from Matthew 24, verse 15, God willing, next time. Let us pray.